In this series of videos, we're exploring how to access data over the internet. It will take several steps to do this as there are several steps involved. The reason why we want to access data over the internet is there's so much out there that we can use. We know that a lot of cities like Cincinnati, Chicago, Seattle offer open data initiatives where they have things like health and safety inspections, and spending available online. There's also weather data available online, lots of things. The example that we're going to use is a JSON stream that I wrote a few years back that's essentially a list of unique plants. And by unique plants, I mean scientific definitions of plants. So one of the steps that we have to do is we have to make a network connection to get this data. And that's what we're going to take a look at in this video. I'll show you the finished product now, which we'll likely do in a different video. Reason I'm showing you this finished product is it's to me, it's confusing in one sense because there's a whole cluster of classes that we're looking at here between line 33 and really line 40, a whole cluster of classes here that seem kind of redundant. They either seem redundant or it's not very clear what's going on. This is something that confused me in Java. Uh, I remember back in 1999, I took the Java certification exam. At the time, Java had just gone from 1.1 to 1.2 or Java 2. And um, I remember when I took the exam, I completely bombed the entire section on networking and buffered readers just because they were so overwhelming to somebody learning something new. They still are confusing to me, I'll confess that, but I have a better idea and understanding of what they are, and I hope to share that with you in this video. So we're not going to do any hands-on code in this video. We're just going to take a look at the classes that we are going to use when we do the hands-on code. That way the hands-on example will go much quicker. So if you're looking for hands-on, uh, I'll request that you go to the next video in the series. So we're going to look at classes URL, HTTP URL connection, Input stream, buffered input stream, input stream reader, buffered reader, and string builder. We'll look at these one at a time. URL is probably one of the easiest because it's easy to explain. It's just an object representation of a URL. So you may or may not know these things, but if you take a look at a URL, look at the one here, uh, you know, hidden behind here is HTTP. Uh, if I click and copy, we might see it there. Uh, then we have a, a host, which in this case is plantplaces.com. And then we have a port. The default port for the web is 80. Uh, you can specify the port right after the domain name like so. If you put in 80 after most websites, it will just simply redirect to that same website because 80 is the default port for web traffic. Uh, so you don't have to put it in, but you can. And if you happen to be on a server that uses a different port, you can specify that different port. There are other ports that do other things like uh, email. I want to say is port 25. I might be wrong, and I'm sure if I am, someone will correct me in the comments. Uh, FTP 22. Once again, I may be wrong. But nonetheless, different ports have different purposes. It's kind of like going to an apartment building, and everybody has a different door, and those doors have numbers on them. Those numbers are essentially ports, which means I open this door with this number and I know my friend's going to be there. If I open a different door with a different number, somebody else is going to be there who I might not know. Then after that, we have the file that we're retrieving. In this case, it's a Perl script that's running, uh, sitting in this directory that we see here, along with some URL parameters that follow. So URL is just a way that we represent that concept. Now with that, we have HTTP URL connection, which is, guess what? Uh, a specific uh, a subclass of URL connection. URL connection is a different class. This one just is a URL connection that understands a little bit about uh, how HTTP works and is able to add some convenience factors to it. So HTTP URL connection might share a connection with other resources. And if so, if you issue a close on this HTTP URL connection, it says, okay, I no, no longer need the underlying socket, but somebody else might, so we'll leave it open. On the other hand, if you call disconnect, you're saying, okay, if nobody is using the socket anymore, we can go ahead and close it. So a little nuance there between close and disconnect, always a good idea to do that so you don't leak memory, you don't essentially leave a connection open. So those two classes, I think, are the, are the most self-explanatory. It's the next four that get a little bit tricky. So input stream is an abstract superclass. So uh, that's kind of redundant because an abstract class by definition is a superclass or uh, would need to be a superclass to be operational at least. This is just looking at bytes. So it's an input stream of bytes, essentially zeros and ones. That's all. And it has methods that will read the next byte. 
byte. So a very simple concept and, and essentially a low level just reading stuff, reading zeros and ones. Now a buffered input stream, this is where I get confused or, you know, I will hopefully explain this to you so it makes sense, but hopefully or maybe you'll understand why I'm confused as well. A buffered input stream is a subclass of input stream, that thing we were just looking at. Where I get a little bit confused here is that it also has a constructor signature that accepts an input stream as an argument. As a matter of fact, it requires an input stream as an argument because there are only two constructors to buffered input stream and they both have input stream as a parameter. So you can't get a buffered input stream unless you already have an input stream. I'm okay with that, but then the fact that it also extends from input stream, it, it feels a bit convoluted. It feels like superclass knows too much about subclass and or vice versa. So what this is doing is this is uh, just an enhancement to the input stream we talked about earlier, but what it's doing is it's essentially reading chunks of data into an array. And then when we call a read operation, it's reading that data out of this in memory array, and then it's backfilling it with more stuff. It also, because it is buffered, it has a few other options. Mark tells us where this is in the array where we're reading, and then reset says, okay, let's go back to that mark and let's start reading all over again. So a couple of extra options with buffered input stream. That's something that you almost always want to use. If you have an input stream, good idea to add this buffered input stream for performance reasons. Um, I kind of think it would be worth just having a direct route to buffered input stream, but okay, no problem. So now after we have our input, our buffered input stream, we have to read it, but we have to read it into characters because remember up till this point, talking about buffered input stream, all it's doing is shooting back zeros and ones to us. It has no idea what those zeros and ones actually represent. So the input stream reader is the thing that takes those zeros and ones and says, oh, okay, this is a letter. This is a letter per some kind of encoding, UTF-8, Unicode, any of these other encodings. It's going to say, when I read these zeros and ones, I know this needs to be an uppercase A versus being a lowercase b or something like that. So that's the point turning zeros and ones into something that actually makes sense to humans. Now, as you might guess, there's more. There's a buffered reader. So here again, this works similar to the uh, buffered input stream we were talking about earlier. Now, what's interesting is you see buffered reader and input stream reader, it, which sounds like buffered input stream and input stream. We know that buffered input stream is a subclass of input stream. You might think that buffered reader is a subclass of input stream reader. Uh, not so. The two actually are not related in a hierarchy, uh, but they do work together very frequently. So buffered reader is, is just essentially an enhancement that lies on top of input stream reader, and it's able to read uh, characters into a buffer for more efficient operations. So all four of these classes we need to go from URL to data. One more consideration, and this is optional but highly recommended, and that is something called String Builder. Now the reason is, if we're reading in data like the JSON data that I showed you earlier, there's a good chance we're going to be reading one line at a time, and we need to convert it to one entire string. Now strings in Java are immutable for efficiency reason. That means strings cannot be changed. Now that's weird, why is that? Well, it's more efficient that way. Uh, but then you say, but no, I change strings all the time. I use Brandan plus space plus Jones and I get Brandan Jones. Well, what, what actually is happening anytime you use a plus is it's creating a new string in memory. So Brandan plus space means there are three strings in memory, Brandan, space, and then a new string, Brandan space. Brandan plus space plus Jones means there's even more strings because we have Brandan, space, Jones, all as independent strings then Brandan space, yeah, that's another string, and then Brandan space Jones. So you see the plus operations quickly get uh, grow memory very quickly. And if we're doing a lot of plus operations, particularly within iteration or a loop, we don't want to create new objects each time and eat up our memory. We need something a bit more efficient. So string builder or string buffer uh, is a more efficient way of doing this. Uh, string builder, string buffer is mutable. That means that we can use this append method and we can continue to add more and more to the end of this. And then finally, at the very end, uh, we can emit a true string. 
So, uh, and by the way, what's the difference between string builder and string buffer? This is a really good interview question. String builder is not thread safe, string buffer is. So you might think, oh, I'll just use string buffer all the time then. Well, it, there is some overhead to thread safety. And if you're using this all in one thread, which the vast majority of times is what you're going to be doing, then you have all that overhead for the wrong reason. So similar to the difference between a hash table and a hash map or a vector and an array list where one is thread safe, the other is not. If you don't need that thread safety, then don't use it. If you don't need the thread safety, use string builder. It's going to be more efficient. If you do need the thread safety, use string buffer. So with that, I want to just give a quick overview of what we're going to do in the next lecture. We're simply going to create this network DAO. We're going to start with the URI as a string, convert it to a URL, open a connection to that URL, open the input stream, which reads one byte at a time, uh, put that into a buffered input stream, which is going to read it into memory, then wrap the buffered input stream in an input stream reader, which changes zeros and ones into characters, and then wrap that input stream reader into a buffered reader, which reads more characters into a buffer and then serves those to us from that buffer. After that, we're going to iterate over this buffered reader. We're going to read one line at a time. We're going to disconnect our URL connection. And finally, we're going to return the entire string that results, which in our case is going to be this JSON that you see here. But on the other hand, this network DAO is agnostic. It, it doesn't care what data it's reading or writing. So we'll be able to call this from other places as well. So I hope this video has been helpful. I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.